You're listening to Accounted For, the Canadian podcast that explores the intangibles of every career. I'm your host, Daniel Lee. Hey everyone, welcome back to Accounted For. We are a podcast on a mission to expand your perspectives, have you question the defaults, and get you inspired to action for your own career. And that's for you folks who are tuning in for the first time ever. Just wanted to give you a little backdrop of what this podcast is about. So before we hit the episode for this week, you veterans will know this is a quick announcement that the podcast is brought to you by OMD Ventures. OMD Ventures. That is my platform focused on everything human capital investing. If you don't know what that means, definitely check it out at omdventures.com or oldmandan.com guess what the omd stands for you got it right yeah it's old man dan and on the actual platform you'll see everything from my weekly newsletters articles podcasts and the vlog and so yeah if this is really kind of cup of your cup of tea then the other stuff i pump out every week all the weird digital media content stuff might actually be up your alley so definitely check it out and support the community and I also include links to subscribe as well as um, links to also just take you to the platform page where you can actually learn more about what it is that I do. And all that will be in the descriptions below. And if you are already a veteran podcast fan, please continue to support it by not just listening to it, but also telling your friends about it. And, you know, what better friend out there than a friend that tells that friend about accounted for where that can actually change that friend's life so you can take all the credit i won't take any of it and so yeah oh and also don't forget to give accounted for a five-star review on itunes as well as castbox.fm cool so today's guest is marcus raider the co-founder and ceo of hostaway hostaway is a global property management software company And it has locations all throughout the world. Uh, I think the big offices per markets are in Toronto and Barcelona. And so we recorded this episode in the Toronto office because I unfortunately don't have the means to go to Barcelona at the moment, just with time and also a bit of the financial constraints. But I really do hope to make it out there one day. But given this is a global property management company, it is no surprise that this podcast focuses on Marcus's global career and Finnish background as well. And I'm not joking when I say this, but when Marcus greeted me, greeted me for the first time, my immediate reaction was, oh my God, he looks like a Viking. <laughs> he, like, if you see any pictures of Marcus, he has long blonde hair and he just had this towering height over me and it's also obviously granted the fact that i am a short like five foot five on a really good day five foot six asian dude and so when marcus came in i thought damn he is a viking real finish style but that was enough because the first impression included him apologizing to me for being late because he had to help a person in a wheelchair honestly needless to say he is a very kind person and i was just so taken aback by it but throughout the interview what I also got taken aback by was how passionate he was with the company and I really feel like you learn that about him as you listen to his story and so in our conversation we start with how epilepsy being diagnosed with epilepsy killed Marcus's dream of becoming a pilot and how eventually he ended up running a loan business at the age of 11 and how he went through all these various trials and tribulations over a decade-long career in the startup world all throughout Europe, not just in Finland, and how this eventually led to the creation of Hostoway when he came to Canada with uh, his family. And so we also talk in great depth about the various cultural nuances, especially the difference between Finnish and Canadian culture. Like This was one of, I think, a big favorite part of mine where... I just had no idea uh, what it really meant to be cultural, like when it, what it meant to really culturally embrace honesty until I spoke with Marcus. And I also came away with some newfound knowledge that I really hope to utilize in my future visit to Finland. 
And with all that, I really do feel that this was a very, very educational chat in just how the startup world is like in Europe, but not even that, but also just some great global learnings about different cultures in different parts of the world. And so without further ado, here's my chat with Marcus. And I hope my chat with Marcus really expands your perspectives, has you question the default, and inspire action. Hey everyone, welcome back to Accounted For. Today on the podcast, we have Marcus Rader. Hey Marcus, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me over. So Marcus here is the CEO and co-founder at Hostaway here in Toronto. And so Marcus, for our audience who may not be familiar with the company Hostaway, can you tell us a little more about the company, um, where it's actually based out of? <laughs> Absolutely. So Hostaway is a company based of, uh, out of Finland. But we, we only have two employees in Finland. We have, uh, we have now official subsidiaries in both Spain and Canada. Uh, our biggest office is here in Toronto, where I'm based. And we have a fairly big office also in Barcelona and then work with, uh, with remote staff in, in Russia, Ukraine, and even in Australia. And um, what, our, what our product is, is fairly simple. It's a one in all uh, vacation rental platform uh, targeted towards professional vacation rental companies. So these are typically companies who have between 10 and 500 properties that they manage on behalf of the owners. And uh, they're globally based. So we got lots of clients in Australia. We have clients in Italy, clients in Tokyo, clients in Muskoka, uh, clients in, well, Calgary, Vancouver too. And, um, and they need a platform that connects to all the major OTAs like Airbnb, Booking.com, HomeAway, Canada mm-hmm. Stays, TripAdvisor. And they also need to manage these guests. They need to answer all the questions. Uh, hotels, they have a concierge or, or front-end staff. But vacation rentals, you just have, let's say, 20 cottages in Muskoka. And the guests have a lot of questions. You need to answer that. And if you have a lot of properties, you need to hire staff to answer that questions. Uh, you also need to process payments. You need to make sure there's no double bookings. You need to know when the guests are coming and going. You need to know if everything is fine, if they want any extra services. You need to know that properties are clean. You need to schedule the cleanings. And then at the end of the month, you need to report and pay out the people who own the properties because they expect a return. And our platform does all of that. Um, we've, uh, we started about three years ago. And today we have uh, we have almost a thousand property managers using us uh, with almost ten thousand properties. Wow! And we do all of that with only thirty five staff, um, but we're constantly recruiting. Gotcha. Yeah, and I think it, I think it's a great idea just because uh, I I travel a lot too, and I think in in the past I'd say two to three years I've been to like thirty five different cities and. I've seen a lot of this case, especially in Europe, where I, I was in Prague and I was talking to my Airbnb host and he was telling me how it's him and two other friends and they own about a number of probably like five, five or ten different like properties and they split working four months out of the year each to take care of all these properties and that's just what they do full time, just running all these like Airbnbs and a friend of mine at Airbnb was telling me how Paris and like Barcelona are really big where people just go make that a full time job where they will be property managers for a lot of these Airbnbs in these European countries. Yeah, actually, when I, I moved to Toronto, I, I was under the impression that uh, Airbnbs are run by private individuals or like the ads back then used to say it's a single mom who wants to have food for groceries and Airbnb allows her to do that or go on holiday. Um, but I it was here right here in Toronto where I found out that a lot of the market is actually run by professional companies. And it's, it's pretty, okay, for, it's easy for me to say, but after doing six months of research, it's pretty obvious why you would want professional property managers. Uh, because individuals, if they have a, have a day job, they have other things to tend to. And if they need to organize cleaning, sometimes there's mistakes that happen. Now, when you're traveling, whether you're traveling for business or, or pleasure, you don't actually want anything to go wrong. You don't want to show up at your dream home by the by the ocean only to find out that oh sorry you it's already taken by someone else or you don't want to enter it and find out oh it's everything's dirty what's going on or or even worse you don't want to get uh, get a cancellation 
You don't want a message when you're on, uh, getting on the plane saying, hey, sorry, my uh, grandma's coming over. She's going to use it. I can't host you. Bye. And professional property managers who do it full time, they, they can just provide a more consistent service to the guests. And that's uh, that also benefits platforms like Airbnb, which um, despite the amazing growth, uh, they do have a problem with the service offering compared to a hotel. Let's say Hilton and Marriott, the reason they're so big and good is that it's consistent. You can go anywhere in the world. And if you've been, if you're a regular visitor to Marriott hotels, you know what to expect, even in an entirely new country. But if you, if you go and you rent, you rent apartments like in, in Barcelona, if you haven't lived in an apartment in Barcelona, you're not going to know that they don't have elevators. And if they do, they're tiny. Those are things that you wouldn't know. And that's not a problem if you stay with Marriott or Hilton because their elevators are big and every Marriott has an elevator. But those are just things that, that lower the consistency of the service. And that's why professional property managers have a, have a very clear uh, demand in the industry. Yeah, 100%. I can definitely relate with that. Um, and for the guests who... You know, it's, a, it's unfortunate that you can't, I think see this visually but markets is i think by all definition um finnish and you can i kind of immediately felt it when i first met him just because i'm i'm also a short asian guy but marcus is this this big tall viking looking guy especially with your long hair it really (laughs) kind of adds to the visual appearance um but so did you were you born and raised in finland and if you were what kind of city were you from not uh not really i was Actually, yes, I was raised in Finland, in, in Helsinki. I lived in the, in the suburbs, which, uh, which there means 20 minutes away from downtown. Uh, but I was actually born in Sweden, so I have a Swedish passport. And I spent, well, my parents divorced when I was one year old, so I spent a lot of time commuting between Sweden and Finland in a city called Gothenburg, which is really beautiful. And uh, my wife is Polish. I met her when I was studying. So I have lived also in Poland. And then, well, we, when we decided that this long distance relationship between Poland and Finland is something serious, we decided to get married. Then we had to find some place to live. And we started out in Finland and actually neither one of us found it really the best place. Or we, we just wanted to explore. We had wanderlust so one one night we came up with this idea hey let's move to Amsterdam and we did exactly that it took about three months of preparations that's well it was our first move abroad so yeah it took three months now we can make a move like that in a couple of minutes but uh, but that was really exciting because uh, the career I got there my wife had a job already she could stay with her current company was as a business traveler Well, that's not really a career. I had an actual job to do as well. But part of that job was that I was constantly flying everywhere. And uh, that was really nice because I got to meet a lot of different cultures. I got to do business in different cultures. Um, If one of the listeners out there ever want to set up an official company in Bulgaria, then uh, please contact me. I know exactly which lawyer to use. Um, but more importantly, I got to I got to travel and see the world, and um, and that was really, really great. Um, we we decided at some point that the actually the the Dutch are a great culture. Uh, the Dutch people are really nice, but I'm sure the Dutch people would agree to, with me that uh, that a lot of people in Amsterdam are not part of that nice Dutch culture, <laughs> and since we lived in the in the center of Amsterdam with a lot of tourists, we, we had a hard time connecting with the locals. Um, and we decided eventually to move back to Finland and we, we did a good three years there before we, we decided to move to Toronto. Gotcha. And we chose Canada because we, we wanted to move somewhere where we had never been before. We had never been to Canada, so we just moved here. Wow, okay. And so it, it just seems like this you know, travel and like seeing a lot of different cultures, it's just kind of, you know, it's been a huge part of your career this whole time. But was that, was that something that you ever continuously thought about when you were growing up in Helsinki? That, you know, did you have this in mind that I'm eventually going to leave, I'm going to go travel everywhere, I'm going to see more about the world? Um, it, 
it's funny because like I I love travel and I yeah, like, Toronto is my I think sixth city that I've lived in. Um, like I've lived in South Korea, Hong Kong, and like Vancouver, Calgary, and now Toronto. And I had that thought when I was young where I was so obsessed with watching like National Geography and wanting to like be an explorer and travel to like different places. And I'm wondering, like, was that kind of like the mindset that you had when you were growing up? I, I think I had uh, had very much the same. I, uh, my father, even though he, he lived in Sweden and not with me, he was a business traveler. So he lived for several years in places like, uh, like Germany. He even lived in Sicily and in China, in Japan, uh, in the US, UK. Uh, so I always got to see a bit or hear the, hear the stories. And I decided I want to be an airplane pilot. And I got, I held on to that dream a lot. I mean, I loved flying because I was one of the few children of my age who, who got to fly without their parents. I was six years old when I, for the first time, went on a flight without any parents around. Um, but when I was nine, that dream was shattered by my doctor who told me I have epilepsy. And I asked, okay, I'm cool with that. Is there something I can do in my life? And he said, no, you can do pretty much everything except be an airline pilot. Oh. <laughs> That's the one thing you can never do in your entire life. No matter what happens, you can never do that. And I thought, oh, well, now I need to change the plans. <laughs> and, and then so then that's why that's how you started a company when you were 11. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, um, actually, that just came about. I, I saw an opportunity to make uh, make money uh, borrowing borrowing money to my school friends because we there were a lot of candy stores around our school and and children around the age 11, they really like candy. Uh, also, children around 11 often have some cash. Uh, you know, they get something from their parents or maybe they go collect some bottles and uh, that cash can be easily converted into candy, which is very addictive. It's a, it's a good route to train young people on capitalism. Um, and it was certainly was a good route to me as well. I, I decided not to buy candy uh, because I wanted more candy. And I thought, if I just give this... Uh, it was a mark back then right. to my friend and tell him he can pay me back next week as long as he pays me double. Then I can buy double the amount of candy if I just wait till next week. And if you uh, use compounding interest, you find out that that's actually a lot of money because what happens next week is that your friend is not going to have to to give back to you. And uh, so you say, that's fine. You can give me four next week. So in the end, I ended up being the richest kid in school until suddenly the the teachers found out and uh, kids' parents found out and they pretty much agreed to pay me back the original capital but none of the accrued interests. Wow. Yeah. And so at that, at the early age of 11, you, or in your early teens, you knew about compound interest and, and effectively you started a bank. <laughs> yes, a bank uh, or more, more like a payday loan or even loan shark, which right. is uh, illegal in <laughs> Finland and in most countries, I guess. And that's why the parents were so upset. But I, I also learned a good business lesson. If there's, if there's a quick win, um, yeah, it's possible. But just make sure you follow the law. Very important to follow the law. <laughs> no, I, I love that. And it's so funny because uh, just before recording, we talked about how my exposure to Finland and Scandinavian countries is actually from looking into the financial system there because I was investing in the insurance companies there and they're like looking into the banks as well. And it's, it was very telling though to like re learn that the culture is extremely trusting. Like there's, I, I think um, I was talking to one person and they're telling me about how in Sweden, like the word debt is akin to like the word like evil or like bad. It's a very negative um, mm. thing to actually be in debt and like not paying it off. It's like if you go into like bankruptcy, like the courts will help you like pay off the debts and stuff. Yeah, and that's right. Yeah, uh, make a plan for you. Yeah, my mother tongue is uh, is Swedish. Uh, so it's the same word as guilt. Got it, got it. Yeah. So then how many languages do you speak? You speak Finnish, Swedish, English, at least three? Yes. And then I, well, now I just got a daughter. So there's a lot of Polish being spoken at home. Uh, I started to pick that up again. When I was living in Poland, I got to the stage where I could understand all the conversations and express myself uh, most of the time in Polish um, and of course in Netherlands Dutch is quite similar to German so I, I speak that as well but then you know by speaking Swedish and Dutch you get a couple of other languages as added bonus you get uh, Norwegian you get Danish and you get German gotcha yeah I had a few German co-workers and they're telling me how um, 
they knew German and French, and then eventually they're, they're telling me how, yeah, if, if you know that, then you can kind of get into Dutch, and then you can kind of get into the Scandinavian languages eventually. Yeah. And there's a lot of kind of similarities there. That was very true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then you, you went to, how do you pronounce it, Hankin School of Economics? Yes. And so that was uh, in Poland? No, that was in Finland. It's, okay. Uh, the, I think the long name is the Swedish School of Economics in Finland. So Finland, just like Canada, is a bilingual uh, country. So there's two official languages, uh, Finnish and Swedish. Oh. So the the two uh, biggest business schools in Helsinki, one is the Finnish one called the Finnish School of Business. Helsinki is School of Business. Yeah. And the other one is the Swedish School of uh, of economics in Helsinki and I went to the Swedish one gotcha they're across the street from each, each other so you get some good uh, friendly rivalry going on yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and it seems that you also did the whole master's program there as well. I, I think it's very common for Europeans to go through the whole yeah, bachelor's yeah. and in Europe you usually do the full full masters but uh, the way uh, studies are set up in in Finland and, and many European countries is well it's it's very good for the for the students so um, you get, of course, free tuition, but then you also, depending a bit on your parents' income levels and your, your situation, for example, if you, if you already live next to the school, maybe you don't get so much, but if you have to move from another town uh, to attend school, you get uh, money for rent, to pay electricity, for food, school books, and, uh, and a bus ticket, and, uh, and even some beer money if you're, if you're lucky. So I I ended up uh, finishing school without any any debt. I'm so jealous. I, I think obviously the U.S. is way worse, but even Canada, I think we're not at that level. But when I first learned about it, I had a few coworkers from um, Rotterdam in uh, Netherlands, and they were telling me how, oh yeah, I'll, I'll pay for. It. I did the whole master's. It's of course like, what do you mean you have sixty thousand dollars in debt? I'm like, oh yeah, well thing about us here is that we, we don't get that kind of full coverage um and so then how how did that kind of tra translate into this now i'd say like more than like a decade's career in the startup world like is was going straight out of school into this startup ecosystem like this technology startup ecosystem in you know helsinki a very popular thing like i know you know people know that yeah there's nokia and after that i think people probably know about like angry birds or Maybe some of the technology people might know about Linux and like SQL. I think they also come from. Finland Actually, as well. when I was uh, when I was a student, so my my major is in marketing, right? Which makes it incredibly hard for me to run anything marketing related in this company because I care too much. Apparently, <laughs> that's that's uh, what often happens to CEO. You can't you can't care too much. Um, but uh, I did in two thousand six. I did my master's thesis. Uh, in collaboration with a mobile game studio from Finland. And this was at the time before the iPhone. Wow. So I was working in mobile games more than 14, 15 years ago. And um, yeah, it was, it was different back then. The way you sold games was by having ads in local newspapers. So you had to contact distributors and make partnerships with, uh, with uh, mobile operators. And then they advertised in newspapers so the people would download games by sending a text message. And yeah, I worked for a company that, uh, that was producing those games. And they had some pretty big licenses back then. They had Monopoly, they had uh, South Park, uh, and they had their own games uh, as well. But eventually they were, they were sold. And I, I thought, well, this is fun because a lot of my friends, they were working in banks or insurance companies, which to me sounded incredibly boring. And... Yeah, mob mobile games got me into the the startup world that uh, that includes uh, beer and uh, and travel and you know if it doesn't work, throw it in the garbage. Let's do something else. That's that stuck with me. And and when I finally graduated, I I started working in an affiliate network. It's a bit of business that's dying out. Basically, performance based marketing, and that was more of a traditional job, but still. It was it was a startup and it was uh, well funded and they treated employees well and it set me off uh, on a career to um, eventually develop business and even be uh, be a product manager at one point um, in various uh, tech startups mostly in the marketing sector gotcha and so the, how, how does that how did you kind of navigate 
that kind of, you know, some would consider like a title change, but in effectively kind of going to these different roles where you go from being a marketer, like focus on growth and stuff, going into like business development and then into product. Some people think it's a very siloed thing where if you're one thing, you have to do one. But I would I'll definitely argue that you can definitely reinvent yourself to different ways. What, how, what were the steps that you took to go through that? So in, in the beginning, after I graduated, it was quite, quite confusing because uh, I didn't know what to, what to do with my life. I knew that I've studied marketing, so I guess I got to do something with marketing. And when I uh, started working there, I got my first job. I must say I was quite disappointed after a couple of months when I found out that once I pay for rent and pay for food, there's nothing left. And, um, and actually that was, I think I was seven years old. That's when school starts in Finland. And I, I didn't like daycare because they tell you what to do. They tell you when to eat, they tell you when to sleep. I don't like that. So I asked my mom, Hey, you know, when does this end? She said, don't worry, you'll go to school soon. Then it will be good. And then when I was seven years old, I, I liked school. There were new people, but still, you know, I, I didn't get to choose what to do. So then I asked my mom again and she said, oh, don't worry, you'll just do this for 18 years and then you then your life will be great. So then when I had waited those long 18 years and finally got my first paycheck, I found out, oh, shit, I still can't do what I want. <laughs> it was a it was a big, uh, big breakdown. But uh, but fortunately, I, I found out that I actually like working. I like uh, producing stuff that's valuable for other people. I like communicating with people. I'm pretty good at selling as well. And um, and that, that allowed me to move forward. And, um, and I actually, in my first job, I think I got three promotions and I eventually got into uh, PPC, into the unit that did uh, pay-per-click advertising. Uh, so display ads. Nowadays it's all programmatic, but back then it was manually optimized. And I was the, in that team, the best one in entire Europe to bring in or to utilize the revenues. So, um, but unfortunately they shut down the entire unit, which is something that happens. It doesn't matter if one part of it is profitable, everything needs to be profitable. And, um, and from there on, I eventually quit when I, I thought I had learned everything. Um, I tried a few different jobs in, in Finland before we moved to Netherlands, but when we got to Netherlands, I, I knew I have about savings of maybe three months. We can survive three months. Then I need a job, any job. And I was prepared. Well, what you got to do if you move into the unknown, you got to be prepared to go work at McDonald's. Because if you're not prepared to do that, you're not humble enough to actually get a job. And, but I was... Either I was lucky or I had the right skills or I had the right approach. I sent in three applications. I got three interviews and I only went to one interview and I got a job offer that was so good. I, I took it. Wow. And were they all, all three like in the startup world? Yeah, and they were actually companies that did exactly the same uh, as the company I work for in Finland. Gotcha. And so it, um, what, how, how different is the ecosystem between uh, Finland and Netherlands in terms of the startup oh, ecosystem? Massive, massive. Uh, Netherlands uh, is, uh, well, they used to run world trade about 400 years ago. You know, any, anything that moved around in the world, um, that includes all the, all the flavors we use now from India, they, they all came through Dutch, uh, Dutch companies. Mm -hmm. uh, slave trade, Dutch. Right. Uh, even New York was once called New Amsterdam. And um, so... The Dutch have, let's say, a tradition of using capital to run the world. And they, they lost the vote in the, in the U.S. when they decided whether the official language is going to be English or, or Dutch. So I guess that's when they started trailing off. But there's, there's a lot of old capital, a lot of people who have generational wealth. And, um, and that's entirely different from Finland, where a couple of generations ago, if you could afford to eat, you were a farmer and most people could not afford to eat, which is why they moved to US or they moved to Sweden and so on. We were attacked by two countries in World War II, uh, which is pretty hard. Um, but in terms of the, the company culture, it's a lot more formal in, in the Netherlands. It's not exactly Scandinavian where the employees have 
have all the all the power it's uh, it's much more top top down and i learned some hard hard lessons there with uh with how you should just shut up and do what the boss tells you but it was one of the toughest jobs i've had but also one of the most useful ones because i found out later that actually the boss was right i was the one doing things wrong <laughs> but uh but it's it's not easy and uh and that's maybe one thing that um if if the job market isn't treating you well maybe you're in the wrong job market you know you can always pack up and move and a lot of my my friends or or people from my school they have contacted me and asked, hey, how do I move abroad? And there's there's nothing you can do about that. You have to actually move. It's very easy. You buy a plane ticket, then you go. You know, everything else will figure itself out. Worst thing that can happen is that you have to move back home, which isn't that bad because you end up no worse than before. But you can't exactly plan your career abroad by just saying, by just planning it. You have to literally take the jump into the unknown. And, and this continuous jump into the unknown, like you jumped into the unknown to go from Helsinki to the Netherlands, and then again from going from Helsinki to Canada. Do you have a kind of process that you go through to kind of, I'm not sure, like maybe plan it out to the degree that you know the certainties and you know the uncertainties and you get familiar or comfortable with, yeah, I'm never going to know this until I'm going to do it, and I'm fine with that. And then do you go through, or what's your process? Or do you just say, fuck it, we're just going to do it, just book it up and go? I, I think it's a, uh, we learned a lot. We, we for example, um, the last time we had to furnish uh, a new apartment, it took us one hour to order everything from Ikea because we have done it so many times. Move into a new place and then order a full set of furniture. So we're experts at that. And that's something that the first time it took us, I think, three months to get the entire apartment furnished. And now when we got there, everything was just ready. We just assembled the furniture, ready to go. But there's there's things you can't really prepare for because every every country has their own um, issues with, let's say, you, you need basic infrastructure. You need some kind of health care. You need bank accounts. You need uh, to sign a rental agreement. You need a job. You need to register. And you never know what's going to be a be a problem for you. And uh, the you can do some basic research, but for example, when we moved to Netherlands, there was one we we put our, our life savings in a bank account, and they had lost a paper. So for six weeks, we didn't have access to our savings account. We only had access to the checking account, and they are not allowed to make mistakes in uh, in most companies in Netherlands. You're not allowed to make mistakes, so they couldn't admit that they lost the paper. So we went for six weeks with having almost no money and that's you know there's no amount of research that could have prevent prevented that from happening there's nothing you can do to prepare for that you just have to live with it so um and i take that approach a lot in um, in this company as well if it's something that we haven't done before i don't really care if it's well done or well planned or well executed what i care about is how fast it can get done because no matter how well you plan there's the there's something unexpected that you can that you can only experience once you actually do it. So a lot of the times when we have employees in new positions, I say, hey, the only thing I want you to do is this one thing. Do one thing. And I'm not I don't care if you do it well or if you do it bad. I just want to see it done. And that helps them get into that mood where, you know, if you can do it once badly, that means that you can do it. That's great. But a lot of people they can't actually do it at all. So they spent months on planning something and then they find out, oh, but this part isn't going to work. And I can see how, you know, moving abroad, you can, if the more planning you spend, probably the more reasons you find uh, to never move at all. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. Yeah, like people go through paralysis by analysis eventually and they find a lot of, like I've, I've had experiences with that too, but I think, yeah, I think the startup bias of execution, 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 just it makes sense like you won't know until you actually experience it and experience is probably the best teacher anyways for yeah, you to go through it absolutely i mean it's different if you if you do something three times in a row and it fails every time well then maybe you should spend a bit more time planning <laughs> but if you do something for the first time and in a startup there's always you know the first time an employee quits the first time uh you you launch an additional service the first time you hire for a certain position or the first time 
uh, someone sues you or the first time you get a customer, the first time a customer leaves and things like that. There's always these first experiences to learn and the quicker you can do them, the quicker you can get good at them. Yeah, 100%. And so you, you know, you've had this kind of business travel experience yourself while you were in Europe prior to moving to Canada and, you know, you worked in um, Netherlands, Finland, and you also went to travel and like, you know, do business in like the UK, Germany, Norway, Hungary, like all these different places. Is there, is there kind of a particular city or country that you can you continuously sometimes reminisce about and think, hmm, I kind of miss that place. I kind of want to go back and work there. Or set up set up next host away's next office in that city actually that's why i live in toronto and that's why we i mean we had never been to canada me and my wife but we we knew what we have we have traveled a lot um, in europe vacations are very long you get five weeks so uh, we spent a lot of time traveling and um and that's why we like this place so much mm. there's uh my father, who has lived everywhere, he when he retired, he moved from Sweden to the countryside of England. And I think the countryside of England is the most boring place on the planet. And I, I asked him, hey, why did you do that? What's, what's the whole point? He was going after a girl, but then they broke up. And I asked, why, why do you stay there? He said, you know, there's always two sides to the coin. The grass is never greener on the other side. You just got to choose, you know, what, what you like. And this has the perfect balance for me. And there's, there's a lot of anything in my daily life is going to be better somewhere else. But if one thing is better, something else is going to be worse. This is the balance I want. And that's the same reason why we decided to raise our, our kid in, in Toronto. Okay. It, has the, it has the balance of everything that we want. And from your experience now living here, you've lived here for more for, than four years. Yeah, four years now. And... There's the typical Canadian stereotype that people are very conservative in Canada, more so than the U.S. for sure, but we're also stereotypically nicer. We say thank you more. What is something that you tell people that you notice and it's just not obvious to Canadians? Like they're actually more surprised that, oh, really, you think that? Well, one thing is that people look at each other and they talk to each other. That's, um, it also happens in the U.S., uh, but in the U.S., it's um, and of course in big cities like Toronto, it's not it's not that obvious. But just if you if you go to a lot of places in the world and you walk down the street, you can't just look a stranger in the eye and smile. Or you can, but the stranger is not going to look at you. And that's something that that happens even here in downtown Toronto. It happens, but especially as you go to to smaller towns around Canada. You know, you, you smile and you nod to people. You say, uh, have a good day. And, um, and that's something that I really appreciate, even though I'm Finnish, we probably have the largest private space in the world. So having a personal space is very important. Um, for example, in the grocery store on Friday night, when everyone wants to pick up milk, they, they stand nicely in line so that you don't get within one meter of another human being because that's your personal space. So, you know, if someone else is taking milk, then then you wait until they're gone and then you go and pick up your, and you quickly move away so someone else can come. And um, and in Canada, people are much more friendly and, um, and open. Oh, wow, I had no idea. So that's a very, it's a cultural thing in Finland. To yeah, yeah. Give a I've, lot of I've heard space. that in, in Japan or especially Tokyo, it's, it's the same thing. Like you need to give private space because they have so little space that people have, basically create their own bubbles but in in finland if you if you walk past 100 people and look them all in the eye there's a very small chance anyone is looking you in the eyes at the same time i i heard about that for in the netherlands my friend my um dutch friend was telling me how everyone just kind of keeps to their selves and like or if you have a friend group you kind of have kind of a close friend group and you're not really going out and trying to add people to it either and just kind of an exclusivity like She's telling me, yeah, on the bus, you don't see people like randomly talking to each other. It's just, yeah, different groups that kind of seclude themselves. Is that similar? Uh, like, is that what your experience has been as well? Yes, very, very much so. And um, and perhaps one thing that uh, that Canadians don't don't recognize that comes to a surprise to many is that family events are not family exclusive in Canada. So we got invited to a lot of Christmases and Thanksgivings that 
in in Finland or the Netherlands, you would never get invited to unless you marry into the family. That's the only way you can get into a family Christmas party. Um, and and that's something that I think most Canadians don't know that it's uniquely Canadian to invite basically friends or colleagues to a family gathering. And that's that's something that uh, really made us fall, fall in love with the country. Yeah, I can, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I can definitely see that. And I, and I think it might be a confirm, uh, confirmation bias, but I guess it might be just because the country itself is built by a lot of immigrants and a lot of people don't have extended families here. So maybe that's why we kind of have to form a hodgepodge family group and we're very more open to that. But it's true. Like I, I don't think I was that cognizant of it, but yeah, like it's true that I think in like Japan, like when I go, like I, I sometimes feel very okay with being a solo traveler when I'm in Japan because they're so appreciative of like private space. I don't feel weird being like eating at a restaurant by myself. Whereas in here, like I feel it's just a very like a social communal thing that if you kind of are by yourself and you want like an alone time, it's kind of weird to do that. Yeah. I mean, one thing here in, uh, maybe less in Toronto, but definitely in, in Canada is that you can go to a bar, you can order a beer, you can talk to people. Now you can't do that in Finland. Mm. Even two people going to a bar would be something unusual. You, you would go by yourself, you get a beer. The only conversation you have with the bartender is literally one beer and maybe thank you. And then you sit alone, you drink your beer and you leave the bar. Mm. It's very quiet, very quiet. And there's a, there's, a, there's a movie that has a scene exactly like that. It's called The Man Without a Past. Mm. Yeah. What? What other kind of big cultural, it could be a business cultural thing or like a personal cultural thing that do you feel that Canadians would be shocked by if they were to visit Finland? Uh, one thing definitely is the the honesty and the, and the trust. I was just, uh, we were, earlier today we had a meeting about a, a new position that we're announcing and I, I have been recruiting for that position before. One of the problems I have here is that if I ask them questions, they, they, for example, do you have experience with this or do you have, a, have you done that? They will say yes, just to get an interview. And then at the interview, I find out, or I can even look at their CV and find out that they're lying. And that wouldn't happen in Finland. And when I ask people, what are their weaknesses? They come up with things that's just not true. Like, oh, I work too much or I'm too passionate. That's my biggest weakness. If you ask someone in Finland at a job interview, they will say, oh, my weakness is that people hate me because I scream at them. But I only do that when they do a shitty job. And that's, you know, to me, it's, it's very hard here to get to know people professionally because they put up an image. And what I, what I, look for when when we recruit this i i don't really care what they're good at i just want to know what they can offer and more importantly what they're missing so that we know because otherwise if, if someone says oh i'm an expert on adwords then we're going to give them a lot of responsibility on that but if they're not actually an expert they're going to fail now in finland nobody would claim to be an expert on something that they're not an expert in and that's that's a big difference but i i do understand the competition is and also the diversity is so much higher here that maybe you have to sometimes make these white lies or exaggerations but at least i i appreciate the the honesty of you know being able to apply for a job and say no i don't have experience with this no i don't know if i'm gonna be good at it but i'll try my best and you can you can get a job with that in Finland, but you can't get a job with that attitude here because you won't even get an interview. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's cool. And I think, yeah, I think I'll actually very much like Finland then. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say my experience has been, yeah, like most people, like when you're in school, like when you're in school, like I remember people would tell you, fake it till you make it, like go to interviews, fake it, mm-hmm. make them like you. And yeah, it's like, it might be the competition thing, but, and then I tell people, honestly, it goes so much better. Like I, I think I got addicted to that after like my first job when I straight up told my manager, like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I just copied everything from last year. And he was like, that's a very honest answer. I appreciate that. I was like, great. And he's like, now this changes because we can't say that to the partner. And then we changed the answer. But it's, it's true. Like I, it's something that is frustrating, but I find for, like for the listeners as well, like if you can be honest, it actually goes a long way. And I think that's actually an advantage in Toronto where because it's not that common when you actually get honest, you actually have a polarized point of view. Like 
when I was in consulting, like 50, I tell them 50% of the people hated me and 50% loved me because I was very honest and blunt about things. But I think, yeah, maybe embracing that Finnish culture might be an asset for people in Canada as well. Well, embracing it isn't that that easy. When we when we first started recruiting people, I ran into a lot of cultural uh, problems. And I, I shouldn't run into that because I've done businesses in many different countries. I've set up, set up companies in many different countries in my previous jobs. And... Uh, I, I didn't think that I was going to have cultural clashes, but but one of the things that the the founders, even though my my co-founder is Iranian, he doesn't uh, even speak Finnish, but he lives in Finland. Um, we, we're very Finnish. Yeah, I'm also technically not Finnish, <laughs> I guess. Um, we, we still had a very Finnish culture and when we started working, actually one of our first hires was uh, uh, Dutch and then Russians. Now what we didn't realize is that we all share the same, we we're very honest and very, uh, very truthful, but we, you know, if someone does a good job, you say, this was a good job. And if someone does a bad job, they say, this was a bad job, which is just, just a casual statement, as a matter of fact. and. Then I think it was our first hire who was British and they were, he was so offended when I said, this is a bad job. It's like, no, you can't, you can't say it like that. You can't, you can't just come and say that I did a bad job. You need to first compliment me. Then you need to do small talk. And then you need to get to the point that there are certain areas that I can improve on. And, and I thought, oh shit. So now if someone does a bad job, I can't tell them that. And if they do a good job, I can't tell them that either. Like, how is this going to work? But eventually it worked itself out fine. I've, I've come to learn with the compromise. But I'm, I'm a bit afraid that uh, we even put in the job ads so we have a Scandinavian culture. Maybe I'm building a certain culture within the company just in the office here in Toronto. I'm probably in the office in Barcelona too, where we are very open. We are very transparent. We're very straightforward. We say what's on our mind. And maybe it will make it hard to recruit in the future. Because people expect, they don't expect that. They might read it in the description that we're, we're honest and open, but maybe they, they don't actually want to work like that. I don't know. Maybe that's a good thing, though, because then you'll now push away people who might not be fitting to that kind yeah. of culture. And it could be that people who get turned away from other Toronto startups who want people to tell white lies and who, who don't like people who are blunt and honest, they might be drawn to your company now where they go, Oh, I can actually be honest here. I can be myself, and you yeah. get that one thousand true fans by like Kevin Kelly's definition. And these are kind of the growing pains that you're currently experiencing as you are running a company of your own. And so, when you moved to Canada, you you had already kind of visited. You kind of you knew that you would come here, and you you were previously a musician, a company in Finland, and you started hosting what, five months after leaving musician, like. What was that journey like? Did you come with the intention to start a company when you came no, to Toronto? No, definitely not. Uh, actually, we wanted to move to North America because when we were living in Amsterdam, we watched a TV series called Suits. Oh. And we always wanted to move to New York. And when we did move to Toronto, we didn't even know that the show isn't filmed in New York. It's filmed in Toronto. So we got quite excited. And I pulled up my LinkedIn and I found in the very same building where Suits takes place, yeah, I, I, I got an in interview there with with a company that does online marketing. And it was pretty cool because the, the founder and CEO, he's from Finland. So I thought, well, I can just get a job here, you know, see, see how it goes, wear a suit, uh, work on the high floor. And then the interview went well, but then they gave me a, a test on a piece of paper. And it had a lot of math questions, which I normally excel in, but but it was all in uh, imperial measurements. So they asked how many gallons are, how many ounces are in a gallon. I thought, shit, I have no idea. Do I divide by eight or is it twelve? How does this work? And I probably answered all the questions wrong. <laughs> I didn't, you know. If someone's six uh, foot tall and someone is five three, how what's the difference? Things things like that, like really simple things that I had no idea because I'm used to centimeters, meters, liters, and so on. And I, I failed that, and I thought, well, this this really sucks. This is unfair. They didn't say that it was because of the test, but I knew that most of the answers that I gave were wrong because I was just guessing. And then I thought, well, maybe I don't want to work 
in a suit in a in a big fancy building maybe maybe the the tv show suits isn't actually what i'm after but i didn't know what i was after either and i i uh, counted my savings and I, I i gave myself about one year to to figure out something and and that's when when i was thinking maybe it's my time now i've i've helped other entrepreneurs become very successful i've also helped other entrepreneurs become bankrupt maybe it's my time to give it a go i mean i have i have the networks i have the the skill sets required and i i know the challenges i know what it feels like when you spend years building a business just to fail it i know what that feels like firsthand from my work experience so maybe this is my time and i i what, what what I think a lot of people end up starting companies by is that they have some personal connection. They, they see an issue. Maybe they're, let's say, a lawyer in a law firm see an opportunity to build a software that helps their everyday life. And then they maybe build it even for the company and eventually find out that it should be a product that's sold in a separate company. Um, I had no no interest in doing that at all like the, the industry that i was an expert in online marketing i didn't have any interest to start any business in that industry and i thought well that's a bit tough because now i don't know what other industry i should do so i thought okay let's let's look at what i'm interested in well I'll, i love real estate what about airbnb yeah that's that's the thing now and then I started doing research and eventually the whole idea started to shape itself up, not because I had a vision and not because I had experience, but rather because I did exactly what I've been doing at other jobs where they told me set up a new business unit. And then I asked, what about? Well, I don't know, as long as it's make money, just set up something. I had the same mentality. So I started interviewing these property managers, asking them, hey, how's your life? What are your challenges right now? What can you what uh, what would make your business grow better and um, and eventually the idea started shaping itself and then then it was just just a question of how do we get it to the next step and to the next step in the shortest amount of time possible and um, and yeah before we knew it before we even had time to think about it we had 100 uh, paying users and um, that's when we found out that the business model was really bad it's never going to scale. It doesn't work. It's losing money every day. And it, sorry, is that when you, I, I read how Hostway kind of pivoted from being a channel management software to now being like a property management yeah, software. Yeah. Was that so, like the moment when you switched over? Yes. So so originally we uh, we decided to not to focus on the professional property managers, but rather on the individuals. So smaller companies and, and individuals don't necessarily have one property. They might have you know, rent out their spare bedroom, but they also have their summer cottage they rent out. So they can be, in fact, property managers, but still they have a day job. And we, we focused on that audience. Um, unfortunately, what we found out is that they they don't have the time or they don't take the time to learn how the software works. And software is pretty, pretty complex. So they need to take that time, but they have day jobs and they don't have the time. Second of all, if the software makes something easier for them, they don't save any money because if they spend one hour a week, they don't pay themselves a salary. That hour is worth zero for them. So they, they don't want to pay a lot for that software. So basically we had users who were asking a lot of questions about things that they could have spent the time on learning, but they didn't and they didn't want to pay for it. So that's why we decided to go into enterprise where if you have an employee and you pay them $20 an hour, they have to do something for one hour it literally costs you twenty dollars that's money out of your pocket now if our software can save your employee the one hour that's 20 in savings and at the same time um one thing that we found out is that the tools that we provide can help companies grow but that that one guy who rents out his spare bedroom and his cottage he doesn't want a second cottage he can't even afford a second cottage that's why he's renting out his spare bedroom in the first place but these companies that manage properties, they're doing par fairly well and they're growing and they're attracting VC funding. Now our software helps them grow. So that seemed like a natural place to go. But like most startups, of course, we, 
realized this too late and we're running out of money and decided okay let's just turn the ship 180 degrees around let's see what we can do and well i'm very happy we only had to do one pivot <laughs> and, and and it was it was successful it was literally our last chance you know if it hadn't been successful well never say never but you know that's that's how a lot of businesses they have these situations where yeah okay if if plan a didn't work maybe there was plan b but plan b was going to be much harder and much more difficult and fortunately plan a turned out just fine was was it diff- what was the process like deciding to do the pivot was it was it just so blatantly obvious that we're just going to do it or was it still uncertain but it's just more so that what you knew right now was like this doesn't work we just have to go for it we have to make the switch it certainly wasn't an easy is the decision what made it what made it a lot easier is that uh, the we, we had already built 90 percent of what was needed for an enterprise solution so we only need to build the other 10 percent and that that 90 percent was really hard to get um so that part was fairly fairly easy we we also saw that we cannot like the at the same time what happened was that airbnb started to become more and more commercial so instead of talking about community they were talking about money and and we just saw that well if airbnb is saying that community isn't perhaps the most important part maybe money is is a bigger aspect of the business um you saw this for example in the marketing before they used to say that we like people and now they say you need money here's airbnb you know it's, it was a very clear shift and that's when we decided that okay well if airbnb is doing it we don't really need to justify it like they they know better than us so we're gonna also go after the professional segment of the market yeah makes sense a, a lot of the decisions in this company have actually been done like that when you you could spend six months researching something but let's say if if you have 10 competitors one of them hasn't made a decision and the other nine had made a decision to turn left maybe it's a good idea to just turn left if you do that six months of research to reach that conclusion it better be that you turn right because if you do six months of research just to turn left you're going to find out that you just lost six months of your life yeah and we talked and you know we previously talked about how it's important to get things done fast and yeah time, exactly. time is extremely essential and for you then when when you were kind of going through this period of deciding to kind of create this company you you publicly stated how you want hostway to be a billion dollar company and i think in that tech Teo event you talked about you said one of your key lessons was to aim high and make a plan so when you started the company did you Im- immediately tell yourself i'm only going to start like a billion a company that can become a billion dollars was that how like you were aiming high? Like was that the kind of the plan? Like what was the steps that you went through for that? Mm, yeah, actually, very good question. I think when I when I started the company, I um, well, it wasn't just me starting it. I mean, I had to sell the idea to to my co-founders, um, but I just wanted to see if it can work because I had been in so many startups. I knew that it's it's possible, but basically we just wanted to prove to ourselves that we can do this and at some point that wasn't exciting enough because do what exactly set up a company well that's pretty easy just set it up (laughs) you know build a product well that's also fairly easy i mean you can take uh take that pen you're holding in your hand right now go and uh, try to give it to free for free to someone on the street now there's your product you give pens for free that's literally a product that's all it takes to create a product and at some point we we found out we need we need more ambition here other than can we do it can we afford to pay ourselves a salary can we afford to uh, can we get customers can we have a working product can we get investors we, we managed to do all of that and um well what we found out is that growth is the way to go because if you if you make your decisions based on exponential growth then that's the only way you can reach it because if you decide you're going to be stable i I read a study i think 98 percent of 
software companies that grow less than uh, less than 50% per year, they go bankrupt within a couple of years. Or maybe it wasn't 98%, but something to that extent. And I, I really believe that because if you want to scale things up, you have to go really fast. But that means you have to be prepared for what comes next. You know, if you have a company making a million, you're going to get to 100, uh, sorry, 10 million. But you need to be prepared to go further than that because you can't stop at 10 million. If you do that, you're going to become one of those companies that just goes bankrupt. You've got to get 100 and then you got to get a billion. It's a, it's a natural progression and uh, you can't really pull the brake at any point. You have to pull the brake if you're running into a wall or, yeah, like our, our pivot. But other than that, there is no, no reasoning. There's no argument behind keeping it small because you, you can't really survive without, uh, without growing fast. And especially if, if you work with technology, there's going to be competition. Even if you don't work with uh, technology, if you're a cab driver, there's going to be an Uber. If you want to be a cab driver, better make sure you own the biggest fleet in the world. Because if you have any other ambition, a company like Uber is going to make you, well, make you unemployed. And so then for you then, is, is the billion dollar kind of, a billion dollar company kind of more of a hypothetical markup, like a company that can continue to accelerate growth? Um, what, what does that kind of mean to you? Like when, when you think about a billion, billion dollar company, what, what are you envisioning? Like, are you envisioning this massive, uh, com- company that continues to constantly accelerate and grow or what's the picture in your mind? I, I believe that with our current product and the future improvements of it and the current business model, we can definitely reach a valuation of, uh, of one, uh, one billion. Um, it won't, it won't be, uh, be easy, but well, Starting a company isn't easy, getting a product, everything else is always, everything with starting a business is hard by definition, Um, but it's doable. Um, But I don't think that will be the way we reach a billion because that will take maybe five to seven years. I think we can do it a lot faster by uh, utilizing the resources that we have right now and adding on more uh, segments or modules. To our to our product offering. Oh wow! So you've got a pretty ambitious, shorter, like under five year time span to hit a billion dollar company in a sense. Definitely, yeah. Wow. Um, and so then, in in creating this company, a company that can grow that quickly, you have to think about the culture and the organizational design behind it. And you talked about how naturally the company you're kind of going towards is a Scandinavian culture. What kind of, so you've, and prior to this, you've worked in, I think, close to like seven different startups prior to building mm-hmm. your own. What kind of um, cultural orga- or organization like learnings have you kind of brought into Coastal that you experienced and you thought, this is not what we wanted. This is not how I want to run a company. This is how I'm going to implement it in my own company. Yeah, I mean, um, my, my experiences working in Netherlands was um, actually... One of the easiest ways to build a successful company is by running a di- dictatorship. There are certain limits to it, but if, if you're the dictator, you tell everyone what to do and you make sure they do it. And if they don't, they get fired. That's a very easy way to build a company to a certain stage up until the moment where you have to give up control. But it's, it's actually, if, if you just want to get rich, that's probably the easiest way to do it. It takes, Hard discipline, you need to be used to people calling you cold. But that's the kind of boss I had in in Netherlands. And I I was forever grateful for that. Um, And that is exactly the kind of boss that I can never be because it's against our vision to become a $1 billion company. Um, In order, so so yeah, uh, empowering employees to make make their own decisions and having a culture of uh, transparency and and constant learning is is something that I brought from that where I didn't really learn much but I I made the CEO well yeah he was also the owner of the company a lot of money and that was I guess satisfaction in itself Um, one thing that I I've learned from uh, from previous companies as well is uh, is that we don't want to build a cult 
a lot of a lot of companies. I think Airbnb is is like that. Maybe maybe Facebook, definitely Apple, where where employees see it as as the their mission in life. They love it so much because it's it is what it is, and I don't I don't want to do that because that works well, and it can even take you through hard times. But if, if you face really difficult challenges, if you have to, let's say, fire half your staff because you don't have money to pay their salary, that's when everything breaks down. Because people, if they, and, and people can accomplish great things by just believing. But if you shake their beliefs, you basically lose the entire company. And, and that's what I saw happen in one, one company where everyone was so passionate about the vision and that's why they stayed. They stayed, uh, you know, even though the product didn't work and maybe they stayed we, even though they had lower salaries, but they stayed because the, the vision was so strong. And then one day when it turned out the vision was, well, it was just a bad business model, <laughs> then half of the people got fired and all the good ones that were left, they they left voluntarily because they they had this, this great dream. And... I, I don't want to build a, a cult here. I'm not even trying to. I think um, I think what we can offer as a company is a great place for any employee to learn, to grow. Um, a place with no bullshit, very transparent and open. Um, and we, we can offer competitive salaries. We can offer competitive benefits. Um, but I want people who are critical thinkers. If we are a bad employer or we have a bad product, then people shouldn't stay because they believe my vision. Because what if my vision is wrong? <laughs> I, and, I, I, and I actually, I, I even tell that to our, to our staff, that if, if customers want to leave because they, they are complaining or unhappy, then make them happy. But if they want to leave because there's a competitor out there who has better products for a lower price, then they should leave. I mean, that's our punishment. We should have people leave to a product that's better at a lower price. We shouldn't fight for that. And um, people get a bit confused by that, but it's it's just just from my, my point of view, I want to make sure we have the best product at the best price point. And until there's someone out there who has something better, then I know that we're, we're the best. But the moment there's something better out there, then I want to see it in the data. I want to actually see customers leaving because it's not always the best one that wins. It's the biggest one who wins. There's so many, I mean, I think Skype and PayPal are great examples of companies where they had the, literally the worst product on the market. And I think even today, even though they're 15 years old, even today, they have the worst product on the market and there's thousands of competitors. And even when you go back to the days when they were started, they had so many more competitors that had better technology. Every single aspect of the business was better with the competitors, but still Skype became the biggest, PayPal became the biggest, not because they were the best, but because they were the biggest. Yeah. <laughs> and right now we need the best product. We need the best, uh, <clears throat> best pricing. Uh, actually, we need to be the best on everything. Um, but at some point that will change. When we become the biggest, we don't actually have to be the best because people will trust us. A bit like cars. You trust the big brands. Same thing with banks. You trust the big brands. Yeah. I, it, it, will, it will probably take us many years, perhaps even decades, because before we, anyone in our industry uh, gets that, that kind of name recognition. But until then, I, I think it's, it's very good to be honest and, and open and let things play their way. And I think that's perfect in the, the foundation, like the foundation of business is trust, right? That's mm -hmm. the biggest currency, whether you're giving up time to watch a video or use a product, it's trust. Like I, I'm using it because I'm trusting that you deliver on the service and eventually you earn, you do so well, like you can, you're consistent, you earn the trust. And then eventually that becomes the premium that I will pay for that trust. And I think it, it's the cult factor is very, it's great in that. Like, I think, I think Shopify is one company where they publicly talked about how they believe culture is where each individual kind of comes in as an independent individual. And then mm -hmm. they add the independent thought that they have. And that's what actual diversity is, right? It's diversity of thought, not necessarily sometimes just skin color or gender, but it's actually a unique thought of that person. And 
I definitely do, do agree with that sentiment of the culture is actually built by each building block that is going in. It's not necessarily we are X, so you have to be X. Like that can actually kind of lead to detrimental uh, results. Like what happened with Kodak when they decided we are not going to go into digital. We're going to stay with you know print photography. And so for you, like creating this kind of company, what what kind of influence? Who influenced you in your kind of vision of kind of creating this company? If I were to ask you, you know, the third most influential person or like role model in your current life, who would you say? I say third because usually people, when I ask them, they would go my parents as like the one and two, and then the third would be someone different. Let's see now, the third most influential person would. Yeah, I think it would have to be the the CEO of one of the companies that I, I worked at. He's uh, he's not a big fan of me. He probably hates me and uh, is threatening with a lawsuit. Well, I lost my options in that company, but uh, um, he's actually a great great inspiration. So he he managed to build several companies successfully and exit them uh, successfully. And then this one company where I worked at, where I actually met my co-founder, um, just the business model failed. And I, I read an interview about him where he had he had so much stress, not about the business, but about the employees, because he knew their their livelihoods were uh, were threatened. He got so much stress, he got diabetes and went into an insulin shock and he had to spend weeks in the hospital. He almost died because he was so worried about his employees. And I remember working at that company. Um, I, I read a funny quote from a Swedish CEO living in Montreal. He said, it's very easy to align every employee in the company around a common vision. The hard part is getting that vision to be anything other than replacing the CEO. <laughs> and that's, that's I guess, what a lot of CEOs feel like, that uh, you know, what, whatever happens is the CEO's fault. And that's the one thing every employee can agree on, that the CEO needs to go. And I remember when I was at that company, I saw a lot of negativity towards the CEO. And I, I was always trying to push that agenda that, hey, look, you have a job. You're happy with your job, right? You get to learn. You get to be creative. You even have a good salary. It's all because of him. Why Why do you complain about him? And, uh, well, since I read that article, I thought, well, it's really unfair because people didn't like him for some reason, or many did, but many didn't. And, and he just cared so much about the employees that he put himself in the hospital for a couple of weeks because of the stress. I, I think that's, to me, is very inspirational. It's a bit scary, but but still, um, yeah, he's, uh, he's doing better today. And what makes you think he doesn't like you? Well, I, I had a good position and decided to leave, and then I stole, well, my co-founder from that company, and which just wasn't really allowed according to my job agreement <laughs> yeah okay and in terms of that kind of the, that that kind of person and that kind of you know um, interview piece inspiring you does it keep you keep you up at night wondering about that of you know the worry of do my employees have anything negative to say about me this I want to make sure that everyone's happy like taking care of them like, are they well taken care of Mm, no, no, not not really. At the moment, what I what keeps me up at night is making sure that the right people have have the right empowerment and information to do the right things. Um, and and sometimes, to be honest, whether they actually know what is the right thing to do, but I guess that's that's just uh, business as usual. Um, what I'm, what I'm trying to figure out is how do I get every employee to understand the correlation between the revenues that come in and their own well-being. Mm -hmm. um, 
um, before we, we started this discussion, I mentioned that one of my past employers tried different benefit programs for employees. And no matter what you did, there was always someone who was unhappy with it because they saw it, uh, they didn't get the value out of it that their colleagues did. Um, yeah, typical example, you, you buy a beer for everyone and there's going to be someone who doesn't drink alcohol and they, they're, they're a bit upset that they, they just get water when everyone else gets a $8 beverage. But, um, but I'm, I'm going slow with the benefits because I want the employees themselves to, to come up with it. I want to hear the proposals that will make them happy. Um, and that's basically what's keeping me up at night now to make sure that we have all the things in place. I mean, we need, we need happy customers and in order to get that, we need a good product at a good price. Maybe with good support, maybe with good doc documentation and education as well. Um, if our employees get to interact with happy customers, that means that they are having a good day at work. You know, a lot of people burn out at the uh, uh, telecom industry here in Canada. Um, and I think a large part of that is that the, the consumers who use telecom, they're, they're buying a bad product at a high price and they're unhappy. So if you work a customer support at Rogers, probably you're not going to it doesn't matter what benefits they bring in because you're still not going to be happy working there. Uh, sorry if, if someone works at Rogers. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the same with Bell and, and Telus as well. Um, and, and that's what keeps me up at night. Now, how to get that is, of course, we need the best product, the best price, we need the best service, and we, we need to have the, the best overall experience for our customers. But that's not something that's easy to, to say. So, so I think the the way to make employees happy it's one thing that happens in the in the work i mean you need a nice office you need you need certain benefits you need a good salary you need people you like around you i think we got that fairly well covered what i just want to make sure is that uh, that they get that happiness reflected from our customers as well no that's wonderful uh, i can definitely agree with that sentiment 100% and as we kind of hit upon the kind of final legs of this interview, I wanted to ask you a common question I like to ask all my guests. And this one's a little more, this one I'll need some guidance from you because I'm not too familiar with the Finnish school system. But when you were 20 years old, were, were you in university when you were 20? Yeah. Okay. So if the 20 year old Marcus were to look at where you are right now in t downtown Toronto, in your office at Hostoy, what do you think that 20 year old Marcus's emotional reaction would be to what you're, where you are right now? I okay, would uh, start laughing. I, uh, I became exactly what I decided not to become. Um, in a good way, in a good way. I, um, <clears throat> I studied uh, personal, uh, personal finance and investing. Uh, a lot. Actually, during the IT boom, I was 16 years old. I don't know how. Maybe I had a summer job. Maybe I worked at McDonald's or something. But I had some money that I invested in stocks. And they, they shot to the stars. And I didn't understand at all what was happening. I started researching of how does the stock market work. And I found out, no, this is not normal. Or whatever studies out there, they're saying it's not supposed to be so that you invest $100 and suddenly it's worth 3000 it's not supposed to work that way. So I just sold everything and that's when the market crashed. Um, and that to me thought, taught a valuable lesson as a 16 year old that, hey, you know, there's, there's things in this world that you can't control, but this investing thing, that seems to be something that should, I should at least understand what happened here. So I, I spent a couple of years researching that and I, I found Actually, a guy in Sweden who's uh, who's my uh, who became my idol. I've never met him, uh, but he's very similar to the founder of IKEA and actually Warren Buffett. You know what Warren Buffett's uh, favorite dinner is? Ooh, no, is it steak? Uh, the Big Omar Mac. Oh, Big, Big Mac. Mac. Oh, because it's va of the value. Because, yeah, it's cheap. It's cheap. So uh, there's this one guy in Sweden who uh, uh, who worked the train tracks 
He was uh, not a conductor. That's a fairly decent job. But he was the one switching it when it was still manual. He started his career in the 50s. So basically the lowest paid job available in Sweden. He worked at 40 years. He lived a very frugal life, just like uh, Ingvar Kamprad of, uh, of IKEA and, and Warren Buffett, you know, in a standard house with, with very little extras. And he kept investing with uh, over the years into the stock market. And eventually he didn't become rich, he, but he got, you know, a good 30, 40 million dollars and that's from being in one of the lowest paid jobs and i thought that's that's what i'm gonna do because i always had this idea that i want to travel the world and i want to make a name of myself or do something and i thought well if i have to choose now do i want to be do i want to have a great career and and be you know in all the interviews and do i want to inspire people um, or do i just want to have a simple job and then slowly, slowly with time gain wealth. I, I chose the, the simple job path. So I was, even as a student, I was, I was already saving money. And, uh, and basically one of the, the ways a lot of people get rich is by starting a company, <laughs> which to me is hilarious because companies are very expensive. <laughs> But uh, I think my 20 year old self, he wouldn't really understand what happened here. Why did I decide to start a company? But, uh, but well, one thing led to the other and now here we are. Yeah. And I, I, I can't stop asking, I can't hold myself from asking. So do you still invest uh, into the stock market as well? And we talked about pre previously about how, yeah, you, we are, I think kind of akin in that we started out learning about Buffett, the whole value investing strategy. Like I, like, this last weekend was a meeting for me because I watched the entire Berkshire Hathaway meeting live and that's something that's very, I think, akin to my soul. I'd be curious to like uh, learn from you, like, do you, are you still investing and is that, has your approach to investing changed from um, that method? Yes, it has because I, I live in Toronto and I have a kid, so there is no money at all <laughs> to invest. <laughs> But um, I, I did uh, value investing for, for a while and, well, then I had a kid. Um, sorry, can't stress that enough, but I, if there's any parents out there, if, uh, well, you know what daycare costs, uh, if you're lucky enough to be able to afford daycare. Um, but I found out that, you know, running a company and keeping track of your personal finances is, is not, not easy because any day when I have to prioritize, do I prioritize the finances of the company upon which 25 people depend on or my personal finances, which which basically only me and my family depends on. Well, the 35 people always go first. Uh, there's no question about that. So um, I, I currently don't have really the opportunity or even time or interest to do value based investing um, savings I have are in in low cost ETFs. Yeah, and I, th I think that's, that's, it's the prudent answer from someone who's a, who has actually studied investing and invested because, yeah, it, it's really hard to, you have to spend a lot of time actually to manage money. Yeah, money yeah. And, it, and it's a fun hobby. It is, it's, it's very it's fun. It's just one of those hobbies that's closely related to my, my job. Actually, one of the toughest life lessons I, I had in my career was when I was a business traveler. My, my job basically was what I always dreamt about. I wanted to go to fancy places, eat at expensive restaurants, stay in luxury hotels and travel the world, meet fun people and just have fun. And I did that. I did that 18 hours a day. I did it for basically my work week ended Saturday night when I came home from the airport and it started Sunday morning when I went to the airport and I, I traveled all the world, not only only Europe. And what I found out was that I really enjoy restaurants. I enjoy people. But if I do that for a living, when I come home, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go with my friends and have a beer because I've been going to fancy nightclubs drinking champagne for six and a half days in a row now. What I want to do is lie on the sofa and watch TV. And my wife, she wanted to go out and meet friends, which, yeah, that's one of the reasons why I quit that, that career. It was incredibly disappointing. But what I learned from that is that maybe 
combining your hobbies with your work, they, they shouldn't be too aligned because it means you can't really switch off. Yeah, like Seth Godin talks about not putting pressure on your art when you want to actually enjoy the art. And I think maybe what your dad said also resonates where there's always two sides. The grass isn't always greener on the other side. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's a great place to kind of end off our chat. And, and Marcus, thanks so much for coming to the podcast and sharing your story with my guests and giving giving us you know a glimpse into your journey. Thank you. All right, take care. So thanks for listening to the podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, please check out other episodes and don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date for the future episodes. Also, I would really appreciate it if you would leave a review on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, whichever is applicable to you. To see past episodes, you can go to oldmandan.com slash podcasts. Also, you can sign up to my weekly newsletter on my blog, oldmandan.com slash newsletter. You can stay up to date with future podcast episodes that way. And included in the newsletter are my book reviews I write, my weekly article in the related to the domain of self-development systems, as well as seven things I learned throughout the week on being healthy, wealthy, and wise. Finally, special thanks to icons8.com for allowing me to use their music, Tiny People, on the podcast. Great. I will see you all next time. Take care.